Euclid is the latest space telescope to launch and start surveying the universe from a million and a half kilometers away. The very first color images from the telescope are now public too, and I think it's fair to say that the five of them are absolutely stunning. The natural thing though, when we get a shiny new telescope like this, is to compare the images it makes with those from other telescopes like Hubble or JWST. If we do this, Euclid's images look good, but I think it's fair to say that it isn't a slam dunk that these newer images are objectively nicer than ones from the other telescopes. In this video, I want to tell you why these images from Euclid are way more impressive than they might first seem, and why this brand new telescope is incredibly exciting. When Euclid's first images were released, lots of us swooned over how good they looked. But I think there's an important detail that was underplayed by both the European Space Agency, who operate Euclid, and by me when I covered them here on this channel. The thing that I think makes these images so impressive is that they were each taken with a single pointing of the telescope. Okay, well, to be precise, the Perseus Galaxy Cluster image actually has more pointings than the others, but they overlap completely, so it doesn't really affect the point that I'm making here. Each of these Euclid images shows us the enormous field of view of the telescope. It's designed to survey a huge amount of the sky over its mission, and to achieve that it has a very wide angle lens, and can see huge patches at the same time. With space though, it can be hard to get a real sense of scale sometimes. Like, how do I know this is a big patch of space that I'm looking at? And how is this any different to the other telescopes? Let's use the Horsehead Nebula, shown here, imaged by Euclid, to compare this new telescope with the old classic Hubble. I'm choosing Hubble over JWST right now simply because Hubble has actually imaged some of the same things as Euclid, so we can do a more direct comparison. JWST has looked at the Horsehead Nebula, but at the time I'm recording this, none of those images are public yet. Where possible though, I will include JWST in the discussion too, since these are the big three space telescopes that most of us are familiar with at the moment. Hubble has released a couple of images of the Horsehead. The most recent one was taken with Hubble's most advanced camera, which was added to the telescope by astronauts in 2009, and is literally called the Wide Field Camera, because of the huge improvement in field of view compared to the camera it replaced. This image looks much more zoomed in than the Euclid one, and that's because the Hubble field of view is much smaller. In fact, this Hubble horsehead isn't even just one field of view, but this image is actually made of nine Hubble pointings stitched together. At any one time, Hubble can image the equivalent of one ninth of this image, which, if we crop the image, looks like this. Compare this to what Euclid can see in one go, which is this entire image. And suddenly, I think the dramatic increase becomes very apparent. It would take Hubble about a thousand times longer than Euclid to image the equivalent patch of space, and JWST is about a hundred times slower than Euclid. Admittedly, those are pretty rough numbers as it's hard to do this calculation exactly, but it does give you a sense of the dramatic differences between them. Those numbers do also approximate the differences in slewing and settling time of the telescopes too as well as the survey speeds from the different fields of view. Of course though, those differences are by design. Hubble and JWST are designed to take close-up, detailed and zoomed in images, while Euclid has been designed to survey huge swaths of the sky all the time, and over six years will map out a third of the sky. It will create by far the largest map of galaxies that we've ever created, something that just wouldn't be possible with either of those other telescopes. Here are a few numbers to put all of this into perspective. In its lifetime, since its launch in 1990, Hubble has collected about 200 terabytes of data. Now, that is a lot of data, but it's nothing compared to what Euclid will now be producing. Every single month, Euclid will produce roughly that same amount of data, 200 terabytes every month. Over 30 years of data for Hubble, but the equivalent terabytage will be collected each month by Euclid. A rough estimate is that JWST captures about 1.7 terabytes each month, so still a lot less than Euclid. For the amount of sky covered, over its entire lifetime to date, Hubble has imaged less than 1% of the sky, whereas Euclid will survey 33% of the sky over its mission. This means that, just in terms of the area of sky imaged, Euclid will surpass Hubble after somewhere between one and two months. 
That is frankly absurd, and it's just such a cool thing to be able to say out loud now. Euclid's massive field of view strikes again. To show this sky coverage, let's take a quick look at the Euclid image of the Perseus cluster. Just to remind you, this one is actually made out of a couple of pointings of Euclid. But they overlap exactly, so this is still what Euclid can see in one go. This image just goes slightly deeper than a single pointing would give. Over time, Hubble has imaged parts of this cluster, and these here are all of the pointings of Hubble that overlap with the Euclid image. There are about 40 of them, and as you can see, it hasn't even come close to covering the whole patch that Euclid can do in a single pointing. I guess I should also say that a single pointing for Euclid actually involves four so-called dithers. This means that one pointing is made up of four 10-minute images, each slightly offset from the one before. This is done because the Euclid instruments are both made out of arrays of CCDs. It has a visible light imager called Viz, made up of 36 detectors in a 6x6 array, and also has a near-infrared instrument called NISP. That one comprises of 16 detectors in a 4x4 array. If we just took images as a one-off, then all of the images would have gaps, thanks to the gaps between those detectors. The dithering pattern fills in these gaps, giving us complete images without holes. And yes, it also means that these images were created with just 40 minutes of exposure time. Another incredible thing about them. Euclid can go very deep, very quickly. There are just a couple of other cool things about this image that I think are awesome and want to mention before we move on. The diffraction spikes here around the bright stars are actually rainbow coloured, due to different wavelengths of light diffracting slightly different amounts, and I think they look amazing. This is something we don't see in Hubble or JWST images, so we might be able to use this feature as a way of identifying Euclid images with a single glance in the future. For Perseus, there are also two sets of spikes slightly offset from each other for each star. This is because the cluster was imaged by a couple of Euclid pointings, as I mentioned, but the telescope rolled very slightly in between those two. This means that the spikes in each image appear at slightly different angles, and when the images are stacked, we can see both sets of spikes here. There are also some extra, slightly curved looking spikes too. I have no idea what causes these, but they look cool and I wanted to mention them here as well. In my original video about the images, I also pointed out these ghosts popping up all over the show. The little purple spots. These are caused by light reflecting around the telescope from the brightest objects. I should have also pointed out that because it's caused by reflected light, we can easily identify which object caused each one. All of the purple spots appear roughly the same distance and direction away from a bright star or galaxy, and those are the objects causing each ghost. I did mention that in another Euclid video, but I just wanted to say it here once again. As another visual comparison, this is the field of view for Euclid its Viz instrument, and this is the field of view for JWST's near-infrared camera NERCAM at the same scale. You can see just how tiny it looks in comparison. Talking of tiny, here is Hubble's wide field camera's field of view as well. This camera actually has two slightly different fields of view, depending on whether it's imaging in infrared or visible and UV light, but both are dwarfed by Euclid's field of view. Similarly, here's the same comparison for NISP at the same scale. NISP is a little bit smaller than Viz, but there's not too much in it. And again, the JWST NERCAM and the Hubble fields of view are overlaid for comparison. To finally give Euclid some competition, we also have the field of view here of the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is scheduled to launch in 2027. Fingers crossed, but no delays. Only then will Euclid finally have competition in space for pure field of view. But as I have said, Hubble and JWST are deliberately designed to do different things. I hope this has given you maybe a new appreciation of Euclid's images, but please feel free to leave me any questions you have in the comments down below. And thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!